Uh, next panel, uh, moderated by uh, the great Ox Williams, uh, um, a uh, journalist and analyst uh, who has also been covering cloud computing of, uh, in various formats for, for quite some time. Um, I uh, actually uh, knew him through when I was at CNET. We would show up to press things together um, and uh, got to know quite well. Uh, and I'll let him introduce his panel, uh, The Future of Pass. And, uh, and this is the um, last pa panel for the day. So uh, sit and listen and enjoy. Thanks. Come on up. <clears throat> All right, um, it's the end of the day, so probably a, a fitting time to look at the future of PASS, looking into the crystal ball a little bit. Um, <clears throat> I've been doing my own little reporting over the past two days, talking to people, and pretty much you uh, get a different reply every time you ask the question, what is the future of uh, platform as a service? And so I thought it would just be helpful for us to, you know, to look at it in a different context to try and understand you know, what the future is by looking at things such as use cases and, um, and other means such as like, um, I wrote these down, you know, how big data is affecting the future of platform as a service, how mobile technologies are affecting the future of platform as a service and so on. So, but first let me uh, introduce everyone here um, and uh, make, I wanna make sure I don't uh, uh, mispronounce your name, but uh, Suresh Sambadandam. Yep. And he is CEO of Orangescape. Uh, we have Duncan Johnston uh, Watt of CloudSoft. Yep. And Chuck Friedman of Mashery. Yeah, you got that right. <laughs> <laughs> Guy Corland of Gigaspace. Hey, Guy. And Mike Selby of Cumulogic. Great. Um, so why don't we just go through, do a little quick intro, and maybe just give your own kind of top line summary of how you see the future of past, and then we can start diving into more um, topics related, you know, to in, in, in specific categories. So why don't we start it uh, with, with you um, and at the end? That's Guy. Guy. Yeah. So um, as you said, I'm from Gigaspaces, and Gigaspace is. Um, it's pretty new on this area of uh, platform as a service. We started as a data grid uh, company, more or less scalability. And we are there for, all, for almost 12 years, mainly on the big enterprise, financial district, and stuff like that. And when we moved to the pass, when we moved to, to develop uh, what we, we call an open pass stack, which is um, kind of co completely different from the, the public path that you know, which is a uh, built-in stack. It's, it's more like an open pass. OpenStack, which gives you uh, the ability to, to bring your own infrastructure or your own platform into the pass, which, is, which means you can design your own pass. Um, we wanted to solve a problem, for, again, for the big enterprise mission critical applications. Okay, and can, if you could just talk about how you see the future of pass evolving, and, and, again, and yeah, less so, about in the context of your own company. Okay, so the, the future of the, of the pass as we see it, and because we are aiming for the enterprise, this is why I, I go this in long introduction, sorry, okay. um, is there are different needs for big enterprise and which are not being handled by current p platform and services. It's mean like, um, how do you do, deal with um, big application or mission critical application that are heavily distributed across the world, uh, that, that are distributed geographically, that need to synchronize the data between themselves, that might need to burst from private cloud to public cloud. Um, Oh, and, and of course, security, which we, we so have. so I hear private pu being able to first from private cloud to public cloud is, is a major issue. Yeah. Okay. And Black Friday is, is, is the day for that, and um, and how you synchronize data between different deployments of the same application or big application, which is spread across geogra different geographical area. 
And uh, last, yeah. and how do you onboard an existing application? It's pretty easy to write a new application on, on every public platform and service that you might choose. But how you onboard an existing application without the need to rewrite it is it's pretty hard, and, and there's no real solution for that currently on, on the pass arena. Great, Duncan, how do you view it? Um, so I think it's polygamous. So I think taking a cue from one of the earlier sort of talks this morning, I think uh, PaaS is, going to, is, is really going to be about sort of uh, the mashup of many different uh, technologies. It's not going to be owned by a single vendor. Um, I think picking up on, on uh, Guy's point, it's definitely going to be uh, focused around the needs of enterprise over the next at least couple of years. So, you know, I remember when cloud first started, and you know somehow, you know, private was a, was like a private language in philosophy. It didn't exist. It was you know a non-starter. Well, guess what? Enterprise has a very set of a very strong set of requirements that we are all now, I think, collectively taking seriously. So I think, at least in the short term, in the next couple of years, that's going to start to dominate uh, you know the requirements for cloud and particularly platform as a service as the natural way to engage with an enterprise. I think that's the the other important point I would make. Great. Okay. And uh, I, let's hear what you have to say. All right. Thanks. So yeah, we're um, we're managing um, a lot of platforms at Mashery. Um, we have 145,000 developers uh, in our API network. So we tend to look at things on what's going to meet their needs um, as they move some of their apps to pass. And um, we handle a lot of data. I think that database adaptability, uh, better database management components is going to be a, a big key in the future of PASS. Great. Suresh? Okay. Um, I, I believe that today we are at PASS is actually playing a sort of a catch-up game, uh, taking the what we're working in the middleware technology and bringing it to the cloud. But the future of PASS really lies in going a level above, you know, abstracting and making people build business services and making it available, not really about just, uh, you know, here is Java, Python, and then uh, now we can scale it. You don't have to worry about the underlying infrastructure. I think that's like PASS 1.0. PASS 2.0 is really providing business services at an abstract layer. That's the future of PASS. Great. Mike? Yeah, we, we actually tend to agree, by the way. Um, you know, we, we really, so, so at Cumulogic, we built one product. All we do is PASS, and we built it from the ground up to be an enterprise product. So we look at the enterprise requirements. So, so the notion of hybrid, the notion of private inside the firewall, very, very important to us. But in addition to that, you know, the idea that Suresh brought up, right, the real future is going to be even more abstracted than it is today, right? Think about abstracting the infrastructure, abstracting the middleware, abstracting the, the um, uh, platform itself, but then abstracting the language, right? right, and getting to a point where you're developing services and you're providing platforms that are, that are really domain-specific services. Great. Um, well, well, let's get into some into some specifics here. I like to you know run through some issues such as you know the advent of, of big data. It's such a buzz term right now, but obviously there's a lot more data that app developers can use. Uh, perhaps some um, Suresh, you can talk about the the impact of that and what how do you see that affecting the future of of platform as, as a service. Um. Okay, it's interesting. So uh, one of the things I see is that, you know, at least in our context, we see our business services uh, asynchronously uh, pooling data into big data in the back end to do analytics. Um, so the, the future of PaaS is also going to uh, combine cloud, mobility, social, as well as big data together and bring a unified platform. And I also believe that the way ISVs are going to use PaaS to build SaaS is going to be very different from uh, large enterprises like GM or Mo Ford uh, trying to use PaaS to build internal IT and internal enterprise applications. And those things are going to be radically different. Uh, one will drive the control-oriented thought process. Another one would, would be driven by the productivity and time to market and those kind of advantages. So, so these things will uh, dramatically uh, you know, converge, especially big data, into the PaaS. Uh, that's how I feel. Right, um, Mike Hoskins uh, had a pretty interesting uh, presentation this morning, and he talked about the end of, en of, of you know, enterprise monolithic, you know, applications, you know, solution suites. Really, it seems like. And do you think thing we're going to see the end of that type of application with big data coming into play, especially and being able to, the, you know, have some granularity in application development? 
So uh, I would, I'll take a stab at this. Um, not as black and white as, 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 as he made out. I mean, I think it was a bold statement, and I think uh, the impact clearly of big data, but more importantly, the analytics. So big data is just, is, 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 is just rolling out the infrastructure necessary. It's what you do with it that counts, right? Um, so I think that, that, you know, that people have latched onto that because it is the closest thing we've come to for a killer app, uh, certainly from a, a, you know, a, an enterprise standpoint. Um, so I think that's why it's interesting. I, I think we always overshoot somewhat and the idea that, uh, uh, you know, coming from financial services myself, uh, the idea that all the apps that, that exist there today will just be tossed on the bonfire of vanities is, is not actually going to happen. But it's, it's one of the things that's shaking up the way we think about this stuff. And today there was a you know, couple of significant announcements, uh, one from VMware around Serengeti, which is an open source project where they're going to try and run Hadoop in a virtual environment, which is quite a challenging thought. And then the other that you know, MapR, which is one of the distros for Hadoop, has been adopted by AWS, by, by Amazon, um, for the sort of high-end Hadoop type clusters. And I think you know, th these, are, these are significant kind of moves by major players. And I think there's obviously a lot of smaller startups in this space of which we would be one looking at that and saying, well, that creates a really interesting management overhead and a management challenge. And you know, workload is going to be here for as long as we have problems to solve. Do you think that'll create some specialization then? Around, around platform as a service? We'll have platform uh, as a service. That so are back to my comment about polygamy. Yeah, I think we're going to see you know, a, a, a fragmentation, but not in a bad way. You know, a specialization rather than fragmentation, yes, for sure. But, but, but think about it, right? I mean, as long as there's going to be an enterprise, there will be enterprise apps. It's just a question of in what form That's and totally, what function, yeah, yeah. right? And who's going to be there to be able to facilitate that? And that I, I mean, think morning I mean. when Jonathan talked about uh, the Warner Music is actually talking about the verticalized path for his music industry in some sense. Right, right. right. You know, that's a case for specialization, actually. Chuck, any thoughts? Yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering, because you, you all collectively sort of deploy uh, a lot of apps through your companies, and are folks actually putting out uh, systems to serve data regularly to other past deployed applications? Well, yes. <clears throat> We're certainly seeing, and I think Gigaspaces could talk to this as well, that, uh, that you know, if you just focus on processing, you're missing the point. So there is, there is now a clear understanding that you, know, you need to handle the notion of a fabric as both processing and data, and being able to partition and segment those and understand the relationship between them, I think, is, is critical. So that's why I think the analytics piece of big data, i.e. the processing, is as important and as challenging. So it's about being able to manage or partition both of those. I mean, I think you'd agree with I think that even more than that, um, when you're dealing with big data, if you're not doing processing collocation with the data, and, and that is kind of a um, platform as a service in a certain way, you can send the business logic to run on the, on the data, then you are missing most of the, um, of, of, you're losing a lot of latency, you're, you're you know, burning a lot of cycles. Um, there is a very nice project, a very nice company called um, Zero VM that is trying to do that for Hadoop, you know, to send the business logic to run on Hadoop. And, and I, I don't think there is that other way. There is no, you can't really process huge chunk of data, tera of pet of data, without moving the business logic to run on the data. Great, okay. Um, moving down the list, um, we were talking over lunch today about, um, you know, uh, the continued rise of popularity of, of APIs. And you know they, and, and Chuck in particular, you, you were talking about you know how you've been working with API since your days at Yahoo, and how they've evolved um, significantly. Um, what what have you seen in that evolution, and where are we now, and and, and what does it point to as we go forward uh, with platform as a service? Yeah, I think um, in in early days, uh, uh, folks pulling data and other services in. Um, it was more about uh, building functionality around particular sets of data. Um, I think now it's almost more about taking that data in, rolling it into your own content, and delivering it to your users. I think that, and that's why I, 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 I'm kind of really hot on this thing of, of, of the use of pass as sort of there's uh, well-deployed, well-scaled data out there that I can pull in um, and know and trust that, you know, first of all, it's going to be easy to deploy and manage, uh, in, you know, in the cloud. 
uh, but also I, I can trust that what I've deployed is, is going to be served at that same optimal level. Um, I think that one of the things that I was reading is uh, the ability to put a single database out, uh, you know, tethered to a, a past instance that uh, can serve multiple applications. Um, and I think that's going to be huge, too, because then what happens is if I, um, say, for example, I take data from um, uh, ESPN and um, sports data and build an app with that and I can centrally host that and pass, I could actually form that data and shape that and actually serve that and trust that it's going to be served across multiple applications. I think that's a pretty unique uh, thing that we're, we're seeing with PASS. Yeah, you were mentioning Uber, right, in that context. Yeah, uh, well, I, I, I used Uber as an adjective, but Uber is another one that uh, can pull the, I still use Uber as an adjective as, as in the Uber instance, but uh, Uber is an app itself, yeah, where, where you're managing a fleet of cars and you're also pulling in location as well as users' location. I mean, that's an instance for their app, uh, but they could actually commoditize that into one database instance and have other apps feed off of that as well uh, with Pass. So that's definitely an exciting thing that it opens the door for. Suresh, in, in that, in, you know, in, in terms of the API in that context, how, how do you see, how do you see the, the API um, evolving and uh, having an impact on on the future of platform as a service? I think it's going to be the API world, definitely. It's uh, API. API world, pretty much, because. Uh, I think the, someone mentioned about fabric. I think the, the fundamental, uh, s the suing aspect of the fabric is going to be the API. And it is going to be mostly the RESTful APIs uh, that's going to lead the world. And pass, um, for example, in, in, our, in our product, we natively support APIs. If, if you deploy an object, it by default exposes REST and SOAP. We do support SOAP because there are lots of people who still use SOAP. But then REST is something that we natively support. We don't have to ex ex uh, explicitly code for that, which means uh, all platforms, not just platforms, but also SaaS applications, pretty much all of them are going to support APIs. And API is going to be the, a very, very central. It's like a nervous system. It's going to be like that. I'll just, I'll just add that we break the fingers of any developer that doesn't start with an API. If they start writing a GUI, then you know, yeah. it's, it's punishment. They learn quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Guy, what, what's your, what are your thoughts? I, I think that the answer is obvious. Uh, that you must have an API, uh, you must have a REST API probably, and then you must be able to integrate with everything, and you must be able to provide it in, uh, like Mashray is giving it, in a very simple that, that developers can use without um, even you know, thinking about it in like a very natural way. Great. Um, Mike, do you have any thoughts? Well, I think from an enterprise perspective, it's even more important if you're talking about the past platform itself, right? If you're, if you're talking about a private platform that's in, inside the enterprise, we take the position that the we need to adapt to meet the enterprise requirements all the way around, right? And, and that, I think it all, it all plays together. Great, okay. Um, mobile, you know, I was talking with the guys at Collabinet today and they basically say that 44% of the apps that they see coming through, uh, their application lifecycle management platform are mobile. Well, what percentage are you guys seeing? I guess it depends on the Are customer. you a mobile, do you consider yourself mobile companies? Uh, in, we're in not any a way? mobile company, we have platform as a service, but our customers that are deploying their application are using mobile applications, of uh, course. Actually, so I think that's a tough question to ask to the past 1.0 vendors. The reason I'm saying that is they're talking about five. Well, 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 <laughs> well, well, well who are the past 2.0 vendors then? <laughs> So, so what if I, what you're I past 1.0. Uh, as a general pass, if you're a Google app engine or Azure, you're talking about just taking .NET and Python or Java and run, running it there. You're not talking about how does it support mobile. That's not, that's not what it, what's all about. Because a developer actually used jQuery mobile or some, some other programming mechanism to actually build a mobile interface. So the platform 1.0 doesn't have that native uh, mobile interface. You know, the developer's responsibility to build that. Uh, so that's what I was talking about. You know, Pass 1.0 is really playing the catch-up game uh, right now in, in the cloud paradigm. The, the Pass 2.0 is really uh, the unified view of cloud, mobile, uh, that abstraction where businesses are able to build services or exposed as APIs, as well as they have a user interface which is accessible, browser, tablet, and other devices. And that is really, in my view, Pass 2.0. Chuck, how do you see mobile affecting platform as a service and now going forward? 
Yeah, well, I, I've, I've had my hands dirty in mobile development for a few years now, <laughs> and, and, what, and my favorite things, I, I mean, I like, I like native iOS coding, I like native Java coding for Android, but I like these, uh, like a phone gap or a oh, Corona, okay. which are these multi-platform um, uh, you know, frameworks that I can write once and deploy, and, and we're seeing a lot of developers use those. Um, w the, the gem in those is that they find a way to abstract um, other services like location, right. gaming mm -hmm. is a big one, social, yeah. where they, they sort of find this magic bullet of uh, pulling Facebook and Twitter in and you can, you can write it, maybe it's a, so, you know, some commands or some, some, it's not the exact Facebook API, but it's sort of parsed by them. And I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that maybe past 2.0 or, or maybe past 1.5 <laughs> is, 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 um, is so, so my stack, and, and I know we talked a lot about uh, supporting multiple languages, but maybe there's some, some common fiber or some open source slash standardized way that uh, some of these reusable pieces, especially social, um, which is very popular on mobile, can sort of make their way um, into a pass offering so that, you know, I'm putting multiple apps out there. I may have coded locally, but as I deploy it, I can actually pull from these readily served libraries, if you will, um, the way some of these mobile frameworks work. Duncan? So I remember, I'm old enough to remember J2ME and that whole kind of distraction. And I think, you know, what I would try to do is generalize this a little and say that uh, what's really, what it's really doing is driving our thinking about the, the being efficient about how we deliver services. And that, I think, has less to do with mobile devices per se, although obviously that's kind of the consumer, uh, ultimate consumer, but it's actually around the, the, some of the technologies that you need to actually deploy in order to achieve that. So I'm specifically thinking of you know, things like messaging, push versus pull. I mean, this is coming up. A couple of our customers are sports betting firms. And so you know, this is a big issue for them. You know, they do not want people hammering on their APIs. They want to be able to push data out. Um, uh, so, so I think you know, mobile is, is, in many ways, I think just a stalking horse for us getting our act together. And, and I think that, you know, that, that is a set of technologies, not a single single technology. Um, so, you know, it stops us from being lazy, essentially. Okay. Yeah, but I guess this question is going to be less relevant in the future. Once right. mobiles are getting uh, constantly connected, the internet is most uh, stable for mobile, you are less getting out of area coverage. So it's becoming less and less Relevant mobile are becoming like laptops, you know, as strong as laptops, so. It's more ubiquitous. Uh, it, it's like yeah, for the next the, couple of years, you know, maybe. the Wi-Fi here, I mean, yeah, it's. Yeah, I'm <laughs> saying, that. It, 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 this, is, uh, this is puzzling me. I don't understand how come this big conference doesn't have a wireless, but, um, well, yeah, but, it, but it's, it's, it's a matter of years, I guess. Uh, it should have been sold by now. It will be sold by. But the, I think there's a long tail, and I think, yeah. you know, we, we need to solve the long tail, not look for Nirvana. Okay. Um, again, we we're uh, chatting over lunch, and we talked about database issues. What are some of the database issues that you're seeing, you know, emerging, uh, and how do you expect those database issues to, to affect the, the development of platform as a service going forward? So, I guess the moving to the moving to the cloud automatically gives you the ability to scale out. It will give you the ability to exhaust the resources faster than you could have done in your own data center. So you need to consume, or you need to be provided with um, scalable databases. And you see RDS from, or from AWS, which is not that scalable, but it's going there. You see SQL Azure from Microsoft, which is pretty nicely uh, scalable. Um, and I think there's gonna be more and more kind of solution of database, scalable database. You see um, VolDB, which is gonna scalable database. And, and, you, and you're gonna see a mix of solutions, something like uh, um, data grid and a database, because now you can really, really, really exhaust any database because you have the cloud to, to burst and to, to grow as much as you want. So I, I think every pass is going to provide or must provide some scalable database solution in, uh, today. It's not, it's not a question of future, it's today. Go ahead. I completely disagree. Uh, I mean, I think it's time we had a bit of a disagreement here on this panel. It's getting a bit kind of late in the day, but um, I think if you're still thinking about databases, you're in the wrong century. 
you know, yeah, that's I, what I was about to say. I think it will be so scary for me to think in a platform as a service, you still have to deal with databases, right? Because the platform as a service is supposed to completely abstract that, that level of de uh, you know, detail. Um, you know, I thought the giga spaces and the hibernates of the world long time back, you know, solve uh, the database scaling and all those issues on the enterprise side. When you come to cloud, right, you still have to deal with databases. Come on. You don't. <laughs> Customers still need to write their application and consume the data. So they do need to interact with the database. They do have a database APIs that they are used to work with. They do have an existing application that are using a SQL that they need this application to run on the cloud. They, are, they don't need to manage the database, but they need to interact with the database. Right. This is what I mean. Well, okay. This right. came up earlier too, right? And, and the answer to a similar question was: there's, it's going to be there's both, right? And, and there's customers that care about one, and there are customers that need the absolute ultimate abstraction, which I think is where the future is clearly going in, in one form or another. So I, I don't know if there's any one specific answer right now. Not, not to not to get away from the uh, country, uh, the contradictory uh, <laughs> responses we need. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I'd mention one company drawn to scale. It's a startup, uh, you know, just getting going. Yeah, that they are very forward thinking, but at the same time they recognize they've got to support APIs such as, well, SQL is you know, something they're overlaying, but they're doing that in order to support legacy, but they're not, they would not view themselves as a database. But they would say they were you know, providing a, a data fabric, uh, which I think isn't dodging the question. I think it is a better way of consuming data. Chuck? Yeah, I, I just, I, I know this may be way out future, but, um, I just think there's a there's a opening here with Pass for for something like shared, either shared database or shared data sets, especially amongst apps that perform similar functions or pull in the enterprise space. There's you know you're working with similar data. Maybe it's coming from the same data source. So maybe I can just through through Pass management point my um, point my app to to a common shared data source and subscribe to it uh, as that data, sort of a data economy-esque kind of uh, model. But I, I think it's a little bit of both, but I, I, don't, I don't see data, data's not going away, uh, but maybe there's a way to um, centralize it, especially amongst um, uh, more common apps. In, in enterprise, there's, uh, you know, companies deploying, even for internal projects, um, apps that, you know, are all... Sharding sort of a concept. Yeah. Yeah. So that's Shem, a good way to put it. Yeah. Yes. That's really what we're talking about, right? It's trying yeah. to trying to garner the economies of scale wherever you can. Right. So can you talk a little bit more about the shared data sets and what you know what you're thinking about there? Um yeah, I think I, I think I weighed in a little bit there earlier. Um again, uh you have an application or a series of applications that are pulling uh from the central data, whether it be unstructured data coming from another source, another platform, or your own, where you have this big repository of data and you're recalling older records or, or what have you. Um, there may be multiple instances of an app uh, or multiple apps that are pulling from that. Um, again, it's all, it's all shared. And that, points to, and that points to the future of data as a service then, potentially. Yeah. OK. A little bit. Um, all right, well, let's, let's talk a little bit about um, use cases, what, what use cases you guys are seeing out there right now, and, and what do you see trending you know, over the next 12 to 18 months? Well, I, I can talk about kind of you know, at least one use case that comes to mind right away, right? If you've got a big enterprise and they have a requirement to deploy applications very, very quickly for potentially very short periods of time, now these may be test bed applications, these may be um, skunk works type applications, but they happen very, very readily. And when you're talking about big enterprises, these things are happening by the dozens every single day. And, and they have the requirement to have a common platform to be able to do that in a very, very quick way to spin those up, spin those down, and also create the portability that those are going to need. And whether that's in sort of a DevOps kind of way where you're moving that along the life cycle, or whether that's you know, a, a simply a, a, an app that is, goes out and is, is later on killed because it just doesn't, it doesn't make sense to the business. That's a use case that we're seeing quite, quite a bit in terms of just creating that, that core flexibility within the enterprise that they just don't have today, which then gives them the velocity to market, which is really what these guys come back with. Every time I talk to an enterprise CIO, it's, it's, it's app time to market. That's, that's what we keep hearing. Suresh? Yeah, uh, yeah. We too actually focus on uh, large enterprises. In fact, uh, pretty large enterprises. Um, and as you know, like most of the enterprises have settled down with their core applications. Uh, 
like for example, SAP would be for their ERP, but then uh, a lot of these enterprises will have a long tail of business applications that needs to be built, and they need to extend beyond the SAP. So they're not making those SAP extensions anymore inside SAP. They're not building those ABAP programming, right? They're building all these business uh, applications and business logic in uh, platforms like Orangecape. And then connecting, that's where the APIs again make sense. So all those, uh, for example, a PR request starts off in Orangecape and then goes through the complete process, and then finally it goes into SAP for approval, that's it. And that, that goes through, and our application runs on the cloud, but SAP runs on premise, and we do integration through APIs on real time. And, and these are the use cases that we are seeing enterprises are doing more and more. Um, and we are not on the, uh, the SaaS ISV side, but we are mostly on the enterprise, uh, large enterprise side, and this is something that we are seeing. Chuck? Yeah, I think um, one great use case is um, the ability to push code or push the stack through for, uh, for evaluation. So right now, without pass, um, a lot of, of folks have to sort of maintain multiple servers, uh, a development, staging, testing, and then finally production. Um, we were talking about this at lunch, actually, but I think it was, it was uh, after you um, left. But this ability now is sort of like managing your code like it's going through a canal where the different locks represent different instances within the same pass, and it's very easy for someone to just green light um, um, the, the code to go from one to the next. Uh, it goes up to production, and the next build can start, and I, that's, that's sort of a dream, a uh, long time coming, so um, I think that's an excellent use case. Duncan? So there is some pass washing going on, uh, as ever, of course. So some people think it's okay to just take an infrastructure management, uh, infrastructure management solution and, and give the, the VMs nice sounding names, like Apache and Tomcat <laughs> and bullshit and whatever. <laughs> bullshit. Um, that's, that's a bit like that, you know, that Darwin Award for the guy who strapped his jet rocket to the car and there's the quarter mile of s s sort of tire tracks as he's trying to brake before he hits the cliff. So, I think a bad use case is to go down the, the same old, same old track and not think about the workload. So the smart, smarter guys in the, uh, that we're talking to are, are really starting to think about the workload and how to manage that in both a multi-tenant environment and you know, that, I think, is, is the first step to a, a, a real PaaS solution. Um, yeah. So it's thinking about the workload and how to manage that. So that's the application and its requirements and making those uh, so that's less a use case, more of a trend. I don't know if I'm allowed to. Well, we are starting to see more pass washing out there. I mean, <laughs> IBM and Oracle for sure yeah. are definitely going. I mean, pass it a box is the latest uh, from uh, from IBM and Oracle for that yeah. matter. Yeah, I mean, that, that definitely seems to be an issue going forward, doesn't it? It is, and I think yeah. But I, luckily, <laughs> luckily, I think people can spot that and and are and are reacting against it. The antibodies are kicking in. So. Great. Awesome. I'm going back to the use cases. Um, one of the interesting use cases that we see is ISVs. They want to that used to sell on-premises software are demanded by their customers to run it as a SaaS, as a SaaS. and they really have no clue how to do that because they used to send a team to install the software on these ten racks machines. And, and they really don't know how to do this and how to onboard their application, which is using some propriety platform or whatever, to run on the cloud. And, and we see it going, coming again and again. ISV is trying to, up, to onboard the application to make it as a SaaS available for their customers. Not dynamic, not make it scalable, not whatever. Just trying to onboard the application on the cloud and without having some SaaS that can, some pass that can help them wrap their application and onboard it on the cloud, they can really not able to do it. They, they don't have the skill, they don't have the knowledge and don't have the, the, the right DNA in the company to do it, uh, unless they're gonna willing to rewrite the application completely. And I think this is one of the challenges that pass need to be able to, to solve for ISPs. Well, great. Well. I am just curious if there's anyone out here in the audience who'd like to take a stab at uh, the future of platform as a service. Are there any brave souls at the end of this day who are willing to stand there? Okay, great. I have a question on the sort of path of the security management of the path. Um, you know, you have the security management team and you have the
Anyone like to take that? I, I think I think I understood the question. Well, why you, yeah, go ahead and repeat what you think. So I think I understood the question to be, uh, is there a way of, uh, a standard, standard way of describing, you know, a complex application and its requirements, the constraints around it, um, you know, whether, you know, there should be persistence, not persistence, that kind of thing. Uh, if I understood the cor question correctly, um, that's not just about configuration management, it's, a, it's actually about, providing a, a, a language for describing both the shape of an application and how that shape should change over time based on, so I don't know if you were in, the, the, in James's talk, but you know, the, what, rather than letting things drift, it's about being very precise in terms of describing how you see an application or a service evolving over time. So there is a standard which I think is worth taking a look at called TOSCA, uh, which is an OASIS standard, which should, should be relatively crystallized by the end of this year, i.e near enough to make a difference, which is talking about the topology or shape of applications, cloud applications, uh, because Guy's right. I mean, I, I think just trying to sort of fork and lift applications doesn't actually do you terribly much in, in terms of the cloud. And then, you know, that's the T is topology, O is, is, is for orchestration. So it's really saying, how do you see that application evolving over time? Um, and that, that I think, you know, that starts to help at least address address the, the, the problem of being able to abstract away and describe things without referencing a vendor solution or something. Um, Tosca, T-O-S-C-A. Yeah, it's, if you go onto Oasis or just Tosca and Oasis, you should find it. It's one of the cloud TCs. Um, topology and orchestration of cloud. cloud. Hmm? No, I'm just joking. <laughs> Okay, yes, we have another <laughs> question. What do you mean private adopt, adoption? Is it like... Uh, I'm sorry, uh, I would say pass on premise. Mm -hmm. Pass on premise. On premise versus off. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay. But, do you want to go? Well, yeah, I guess from my perspective, the, the if you really think about the future, right, so if this, if this panel is talking about the future of pass, and you talk about the polygot versus, versus the single language, um, I think it's very, it may be a little bit cavalier, but it might be also easy to say it doesn't matter. Right, because if you're talking, if we're truly talking about layers of abstraction, then the future, hopefully, is going to get to a point where it's where it's not going to matter, right? And you could have one, you know, the languages are going to be so, you know, are going to be just part of that, are part of that abstraction, and you're going to go for domain-specific requirements, right? If you're developing a domain-specific application, that's the pass that, that you're going to work off of, and, and there you go. Uh, as far as as far as private versus public, um, I think it's evolutionary, um, and I think I, our personal feeling is that that hybrid is going to be the answer. Um, that adds a lot of other complexities. We were talking over lunch about you know some of the data issues and and all of the other things that are associated to that. Uh, having said that, I think we will get to a point we will step into that, and I think the future will step into that. But it's got to it's it, 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 there's there's definitely some work to be done there, and um, and it's 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 not an easy problem to solve. Yeah, actually, my biased view would be to agree with uh, <laughs> um, Mike. Mike, Mike. Sorry, um, uh, on the abstraction portion, but I think more pragma pragmatic view would be to say it, it's going to be polyglot, actually, uh, because I think it's going to be allowing multiple people, irrespective of which programming language background that they come from, to be able to allow them to sort of deal with services rather than having to deal with slightly more um, detail level of uh, in a coding right so but then the interface could be any programming language and that's where I would love to bring in the uh, polyglot angle right that's one uh, answer for your first part and the second one is I think there is a lot of FUD around private uh, on cloud security and all of that so people are taking a more what you call safer bet around going to private I think I truly believe that the economy of scale for private does not exist for more than 2,000 large enterprises across the globe, 
Uh, maybe the number 2,000 can be debated. It could be 1,000, it could be 10,000, but there is a number. Beyond that number, there is no economy scale for private, whether it is cloud or pass. And if you're not PNG, if you're not Unilever, if you're not Ford, if you're not GM, there is no, no way you can run private. Unless so you've got to go public, public cloud or public pass. That's, that's, that's my view. Unless you're limited by regulation. Yeah, I mean, all these people, I, I think they put all these things just to secure their jobs as, as well. No, no, regulation, <laughs> you know, government, re government regulation. Yeah. All right, well, I think that really uh, about wraps it up. Thank you, everyone, for participating in the panel. And I think that, uh, that caps it for the panels for today, so thank you very much. Folks, uh, thank you very much uh, for that. I think uh, we're going to let our esteemed host uh, wrap it up. And, uh, but uh, I, I personally, uh, over the course of the day, I want to thank you guys very much. Let me get out of hopefully feedback range here. Um, thank you very much uh, from myself for everything that you guys have done uh, today in terms of, of your, your attendance, uh, your participation. And I hope this is a kickoff of, uh, of a much more in-depth discussion about PASS and the enterprise moving forward. I look forward to discussing more on Twitter and, and at other conferences elsewhere with many of you. And with that, uh, we'll bring Krish back up and let him uh, close it out. Thank you.